How about this? Can you all hear me? Go louder. Is this good? Louder. Is this awesome? All right. I'm going to turn down a little bit, though. So thank you all for coming out very much tonight. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm Matt Seeley. See, my name tag has the, the Netflix employee thing on top of it. So if you see more people like this, you can feel free to stop them and heckle them or ask them about Orange is the New Black. We'll all be ready to help you. <laughs> Who all seen, seen season one of Orange? Show of hands. That's it? Who's gonna watch season two? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanna thank you all for coming out tonight. This is pretty nice. When I looked at the the invite list, I saw that we have people coming out from the city, we have people coming out from all sorts of different companies in the area. And I think, thank you for coming out and listening to me talk for about 40 minutes about stuff that I find interesting. Um, the general gist of what I'm going to talk to you about today is kind of going to be based off where this picture started years ago. Um, this was me in 99. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about how this picture is dated, though, all right? <laughs> so if you look at it carefully, we see in the back that we have a phone with an, an external antenna. I've, I've heard that these things exist, but they're only in museums now. And then, as we, look, as we go around, we see that my big Christmas present was a DVD player. And it only plays discs. It's not Netflix ready. <laughs> you don't see that very often. And sadly, the most, most obvious point... <laughs> <laughs> now, fast forward a bunch of years, and it turns out that if I bought this DVD player, in the last two to three years, I would have seen some interface similar to this. The, the interface in the middle is called Plus, and that runs on a lot of devices that support LRED, the left, right, up, down, pretty much the cardinal directions, and then an enter button. While the one in the front and the one in the back are both pointer-based devices, so the ones where you can actually point a remote at the screen and then interact with it that way. Now, this was all back in our WebKit era, and we we wrote WebKit for a long time as, as our innovation platform. We still deliver millions of devices that run this, Yet, when we do most of our innovation today, we work in a different platform. We work in one that we call Given. Given, we build an application that we call Darwin. As, as a play on words, Darwin is an evolution of the previous platform. So, we're cheeky. Uh, the good thing with Darwin is Darwin takes, and takes our, our JavaScript view framework that we had running on top of WebKit already, and what we were able to do is to swap out the rendering layer. So when it came time to actually render an image or render text, we don't have to fundamentally change our overall application architecture. We just change that last, minute, that, that last moment before we actually fulfill the interface. So we say set text, and it flows all the way through, and eventually, what does text mean? Is it text content, or is it a dot text property of some native widget which we have? So this, this, goes, this platform gives us the ability to do things uh, much more bespokely. The, the actual activity that our platform does, it's very optimized for rendering graphics, fills, images, and text. Whereas WebKit's really, really good at doing things generically. You, know, you can build text-based interfaces, dynamic things, games. WebKit is a web platform. Gibbon is a highly optimized TV platform. So they both have their own usages. All things told, the team that I'm a part of manages and innovates and builds and maintains and has devices coming out of our ears. So one of the nice things about being on Netflix for a guy like myself is the ability to play with all sorts of different sorts of input mechanisms and just devices. Um, the, one, the one down part I don't like is all the cords. So whenever we change desks, we did that probably about twice a year, maybe three times a year. You unplug your 12 devices and you go plug the 12 devices back in and each of us has three monitors at our desk and we have racks of stuff everywhere. But it's cool because the world it came from was mostly about browsers. It was about, I've got four versions of Firefox, latest version of IE, I've got this version of this, and you get this wealth of VMs. Um, we have. We don't have that, but what we have is a wealth of devices. So I like that that bounce a little bit better. The, the neat part, too, is we wind up getting devices before they're localized for sale in, in the United States or really outside of Asia. Um, this was a Samsung, or it is a Samsung remote control um, for a TV that wasn't for sale yet, wasn't even localized. But we get it out here and we get to play with it. So the, the devices we get sometimes aren't even um, fully fledged and ready for sale. They're just, it's a flat panel and an ugly gray box around it. There's no nice bezel, there's no nice stand. Um, it looks like a piece of crap, but it, it has the right hardware on the inside that is what's going to actually go to production. We also get the ability to play with devices that have various input mechanisms. A lot like the, the pointer-based devices that I mentioned a moment ago, um, LG's been doing this pointer input for a long time. They, previously, they've had a gyroscopic remote control. So it doesn't care where you point it, it's just 
it, it's all deltas. It's all the way you move and in which direction you move. But at, at CES in 2013, they decided that they were going to try something completely different. And when you hold your finger up like this, it takes a picture and it, it has a camera on the very, very top. It's hard to see with this light, but it, it finds your hand. And then when you want to interact with something, you actually click it with your finger. And uh, this is this is kind of weird. You know, props them for trying something new. But the uh, the first meeting when we actually heard about this, all of us were wondering if it really needed to work on your index finger. So, yeah. you got that? So over the time that I've been working here, we've had to really adapt our the way we build applications, the way we, we maintain applications, and the way that we deal with devices. And for the most part, uh, surviving life on the grid was a it's a play on words for myself. Let me make sure I'm not blocking it. It's a it's kind of a play on words. Um, grid as far as Tron and electricity and cool stuff going on. Um, but for me, the, the grid is all about content. It's, it's lists, it's feeds, it's, it's lists of lists. And uh, surviving life on a grid turns out takes much more than life cycles and disks. It takes some actual careful thought as far as building your application. So the content that I'll go over today won't be, it won't uh, be revolutionary. You won't look at it and go, oh my gosh, my mind's blown by reactive programming. But what, what you will go is, you know what? This is some practical advice that I can take away and use and actually Hopefully, have a better day at work. So, I give them to you. Slide one. So, the cool part also about, about working on Netflix is I can steal cool pictures from from movies and throw throw them up on the screen. Now, when we built Darwin, which was the evolution of Plus, we wanted to understand uh, more of our real user metrics. How is this thing being used in production? How long do certain tasks take? And when we thought about um, trying to define the problem that we were looking at, we really wanted to understand. Um, timings. And a timing can be broken down to when something starts, when something ends, and then its, its, uh, its relationship with other activities which are happening. And just gathering the timing is one thing. Actually, being able to instrument your code, that's kind of simple, right? All of us have done timestamps, you know, set a new date time, get it here, subtract them, and then do what with it? Like, what do you do? How, how do you visualize it? And uh, part of how we survive is we don't try to recreate the real all the time. We try to find existing solutions. And as front end engineers, it turns out we live with one pretty much every day. And it's the Chrome timeline. And if you look at it, what you see is you see start times, you see durations, you see the arrangement, the, the, uh, the relationship between one task and, and another task. So this is cool. Um, turns out this nails visualization, but how are we going to get our data into it? And if you right-click inside your Chrome timeline, what you get is actually the ability to save it. And, like, and, and right now when I saw this, my mind goes, cool, right? Because part of being an engineer is reverse engineering, whatever it is. Like you, you download your new Android game, you try to hack the memory. You download something, you try to get through, you try to figure out how it's put together. Um, so we started really uh, very simple. And we started with just a timestamp. Say console.timestamp, hello world. And then went into it, uh, loaded up the Chrome timeline, saved it. And what that does is it saves and creates a JSON document wherever you save it to. Once you open that up, the document is full of stuff. Because the Chrome's timeline is actually relatively robust, right? It's got memory, it's got uh, frame-based information in there, and it has parent-child relationships. But what we described with just tracking time, just tracking start time, end time, and some sort of perhaps message about it, we can see that the fields that we want are actually there. So it turns out you can actually ignore everything else there except for just this. It's all you really need. And uh, that was, that's awesome. Because what, what Chrome gave us was ultimately a very hackable thing which we can jump inside of. Now, going through and adding a bunch of timestamps and doing that ourselves is really kind of obnoxious. So we have something that's very similar to this. We, have, we can in, instantiate what we call a timeline. And in that timeline, we can start and uh, create new moments, new events inside that timeline. And we can start them and end them. And then when we're all done, we can post that data. So it looks, it looks very much like this. Nothing too rocket science -y. But once, once this data is posted, that's when, you get, that's when you can do magical things. Because we can take this data and we can visualize it as a one-off type of visualization <coughs> manually by right-clicking and loading the timeline data in there. Or we can run aggregate comparisons. Since we're tracking, say we have a thousand, uh, a thousand startup timings then we can take and compare each of those thousand startup timings and actually generate one aggregate timeline, which takes maybe the mean time for thousands of sessions. And when, when you have this kind of information, you can visualize the, the activity that's happening, but you can also make really smart decisions about 
where you spend your time fixing. For instance, if we want to say something like make startup faster, that's, that's amorphous. You have no idea what that really means. It's a cloud of tasks. But in this world, my lovely task D, that's a real kicker. We want to fix task D first. So interesting stuff, right? My second slide for the day, this is actually my favorite one, speak for the code. Um, I've, got, I've got two sons, one's 12, one's six. The 12-year-old is there in the middle right there. Um, my my six-year-old's favorite book is actually this. So we read this all the time. I've, I've got a hard time not visualizing myself seeing some sort of bad looking code and having this little guy jump out of the stump and start talking to me. So it's a little mental break in my head. But what it comes down to is our, our, our code base has existed for a lot of years. Both UIs we showed you, the WebKit ones as well as the given ones, they've all existed off primarily the same core code base. And the code base as, as it lives, um, parts of it change, where there's innovation happening, where there's a lot of attention spent. Parts of it, parts of it atrophy. It's, it's the same thing that all of us see in day-to-day -day software development. You can't be everywhere all the time. So what we try to do is, as we're anywhere, anywhere that we spend time, we try to leave it better than we found it. It's, it's the whole kind of Boy Scout motto. Actually, take only photos, leave only memories. No? Something like that. But the, it's, it's the idea of doing the right thing when you're in the right bit of code. So let's talk about, as we're actually writing code, on, on a day-to-day -day level, how do we make our code maintainable for the next person? And I'm sure most of us have written something like this in the past. It's a method, when you call it, you pass a URL, it makes the get request, it takes a response, shoves it in a cache, and then calls you back. But hey, the next time you call this thing, what about just letting the person know right away that you, that you already have the data? And that's, that's the problem to me, because from the outside, you can't tell what's gonna happen. When you pass in the callback, my brain is thinking, ah, asynchronous, got it. Um, and maybe you'll never see a bug because of this. But you can't always guarantee that you're the only person calling this URL for information. Someone else could call it. Based on the order of events, your code, which worked one way in one situation, is going to work completely different. And that's, that's surprising. That means that when someone's trying to figure out what happened with their bug and why their callback is being called right away, they've got to dive into the implementation. And keeping people out of the implementation is one way that we keep ourselves moving fast. Because if you can have, if you understand how your components relate to each other just by looking at how you call them, that's sweet. If you have, if you have to look at how they relate to each other by looking at the implementations of every method along the chain, that's time consuming. That's a lot of stepping. So instead of being clever and being quick, be smart. And just always do it asynchronously. Like I led with, it's not, it's not, a, it's not rocket science, but what it is, is it's going to get you home at 5 o'clock. And you're not going to be here worrying about why this thing does something weird in some case. Um, how many of us here have a QA that just finds all the weirdest edge cases? One, yeah, pretty much everybody, right? There's always that one QA that can drill through your assumptions and find the errors. And if your code makes no assumptions, excuse me, if your code makes um, consistent assumptions, then you have an easier time debugging. Now, we have our own view framework, we have our own state, state framework, we have our own card system and model frameworks. Um, our app grew up before a lot of the MV whatevers um, came around. And as such, we've had to find ways to innovate within it and grow it, but also to hold it back and constrain it so that we don't sprawl. Now, a very simple method that, that our views have is show. You, know, you have a view, a view is everything you think it is, and you want to be able to show and hide it. Um, but just showing, flipping display from block to none, or yes, correct, block to none, is a pretty poor user experience. When you look at Darwin, if you have a Roku 3 or a PS3 or a PS4 or an Xbox 360, you'll notice it's very cinematic. Everything transitions in, it fades in, it slides. And that, that feels really nice. It doesn't just pop. So, for instance, uh, let's, let's pretend it's a day in my life. And uh, the designer walks over and says, Matt, I like all the work you've been doing, but I really want this to fade in. When, when we show our views, I want you to just think, present it gracefully. So I go, all right, cool. I know, how, I know how show works inside of itself, so I can easily just pass through a Boolean and say, the internal implementation of show, when it sees a Boolean, will do something different. But from the outside, what does this mean? Okay. It doesn't mean anything, right? And it, it gets even worse, because the designer's not gonna stop at just a, a simple transition. They wanna control timings, they wanna control easing functions. 
So based on the, the pattern that was already set forth by just passing through this trap, we can just add more stuff to it. And this is great, right? Um, because I, as the, the engineer, I know everything that it's doing. I know how it works. I know 50 is something. Um, but we, we hire a new engineer, and he or she comes in, and they look at it, and they go, I don't know what the hell this means. And they wind up kind of staring at the code, and then they have to actually get in and look at the implementation to figure out that we're not asking for elephants. <laughs> no? So it's, it's, it's about being evident. It's about understanding the, the, the relationship between your components without having to look at the implementation. So it, this gets much easier if you just use JavaScript for what JavaScript is good for. Um, we talked about this a lot. You know, I'm, I'm holding out the first person that said, pass, pass maps to your things as arguments. But it's amazing to see that the number of times that young JavaScript engineers um, still do this. And I think it's our responsibility as seasoned engineers to come through and help guide our new hires and people that we meet to make intelligent decisions. Now, this one's fun. Um, this one, the engineers I work with, they give me a hard time on this one. Um, because one of, the, one of my least favorite things in the entire world that I find to be the most noisy and unintuitive parts of our code base are fix me comments. Um, fix me and to do's. Uh, it's not all fix me comments. It's just the ones that are kind of like, hey, fix me. This sucks. Fix me. Do this better. Fix me. When this is done, do this. Um, and the issue with that is I have no context on it. It's really just noise. It's just noise. And when you leave fix me comments and to do comments, it's your responsibility to leave them and leave enough context so that another engineer can come into that and actually leave the code better than when they found it. It's just not that hard. Um, when I see fix me comments and when I leave them, even more importantly, I try to explain the shortcut I took, why I took the shortcut, and how to work yourself out of the shortcut. Imagine the fix me is, is one of those big, big, big hedge mazes. You want to have a map to get out of it. Otherwise, just give someone a chainsaw and, and go straight out. So this is my personal message to you today. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> um, so those, those, are, those aren't going to, like you can't write a book on this stuff. But if you think about the things which you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and you're introspective about the tasks which you're, which you're meant to fulfill, a lot of times you deal with these mundane kind of things. And when you have too many mundane things piling up, it's really heavy. But if you can, re if you can restrict the number of things that, that you carry with you like this, you just lead a happier life. You can be a happy JavaScript developer. Now, uh, anyone know what this is from? That's right, take only what you need to survive. I need this to survive. I love this scene. Now, our app, like I mentioned before, it grows. All apps that have been around for a while that do significant amounts of functionality grow. There's rarely ever an app that's going to be built once and say, we're done. We're only going to take code away. I've never found it. Never found it. So when we think about as we ship our application to our customers in production, we want to ship them the most reduced form of the application possible. We want to restrict, especially, the amount of unnecessary functionality. So if, if your code has a bunch of if blocks, um, maybe it shouldn't have a bunch of if blocks. Maybe it should just have the if block for the device or the platform that it's on. And a lot of times, the extra code that we found ourselves shipping with was debug code. Now, debug code is more than console log statements. I'm going to say that right up front. Because when you, when you add debug code, what you're doing is changing the default behavior of your application. Now, changing the, the default behavior isn't, it doesn't happen by itself. There's code that looks for a query string property or looks for some kind of value. Then there's code that consumes it and code that reacts to it. So changing behavior in the application is more than just logging that a behavior change happens. So we started looking around for how can we stop this debug code from showing up in production? And we kind of went through our, our past. What have we done before? And uh, I know I've, I've written code like this before at least one time. It's like saying, for instance, just looking at console log, I want to not log in production. I want to, I want my, my engineers just to console log their ass off, but when we go to production, I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna make sure that you won't see console log statements. And this by itself, this isn't bad. Totally, I mean, there's, there's plenty of things that work fine. But when we talk about scale, we talk about hundreds of thousands of lines of code, talk about megabytes of characters getting downloaded, I don't want this on those megabytes of characters. I wanna save that for innovative features. 
So maybe you get a little smarter and you go, okay, well, console log is just one of these console methods, but there's actually a pretty robust console API. I, I can't have this, this code running in production, so you gave me a smart, you say, I'm gonna pretty much build an entire facade that is the console logic that I'll deliver to all my users in production, and they won't know the difference, but they will, because this affects performance. If you still have console log statements, even though they're no logs, you have to handle things, for instance, if you were stringifying an object to log out. Um, you have to now write code that doesn't, that doesn't eagerly stringify, but maybe defer stringify. And then you start you know, kind of going with more stuff, and you go, oh wait, I'm gonna take out the log statements. I'm just gonna take them out. And now you're getting, now you're getting there. Um, you have something like this. <laughs> All right, I totally know what that means because it's, it's just a regular expression. Um, I can't write this without looking at something else though. The, the core of this is when you, when you decide to go this route, you're making trade-offs. You're saying, I will only ever invoke console methods on one line with a closing semicolon. I will never alias console.log with anything else. And you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and leave in all the, the JavaScript which was looking for the query string properties, which was consuming them, and which was fulfilling them. All this does is take out the console log statements. There's more code in there. So now that we defined the problem for ourselves, we, tried, we started looking at how do we get it out of there? And it turns out the C community has had this solved for decades. Yeah, that's the mess that you have. That's how it's solved for decades with ifdefs. Ifdef is a, is a preprocessor that runs on the text before it's, as, as it's being built. And during our build process, we take all of our individual files, we, we concatenate them, then we preprocess the, pre -process the JavaScript. So during our build process, we would have something like a debug flag that is, has a truish value. And if this debug flag has a truish value, then that bit of code there, it lives. But when we, when we do release builds, that debug flag is not gonna have a true value. And that, that code between those two comments, it dies. And it's gone, it's completely not in our JavaScript file. And that's awesome, it's totally awesome. Um, anyone here wondering why we didn't do AST-based dead code removal? All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the reason why is because if we did something that was purely based off ASTs, right? You can you can have something smart run against your JavaScript, find dead code, remove the dead code, and then generate only code which was actually useful. Um, the issue that I have with that is you wind up writing JavaScript to remove JavaScript. And in this in this situation here, imagine that the build type token got replaced with the word party time, and if we had a build type as a release build, it, it might be something like study time, something that's not the same. So the preprocessor would see, does study time equal party time? No, it doesn't. So that, that bit of code will never be run because it's comparing two scalar values together. But if you notice, we had to write JavaScript to make this happen. That's, that's step one, that, that makes my mind hurt. Whereas if you preprocess it, check this out. You just, you just wrap some comments around it. And now all I have to do is say, when I do a build, I say it's party time, I grab my cider, and I get my munchies, and I go to town. Now, <laughs> the cool part about this too is, this doesn't just work on object literals, you can use this on prototypes. So we use this as we're defining a class, if we have a section of that code, for instance, um, remember I mentioned that we have different, in, different input mechanisms, like pointer, we have LRUD, and we also have voice. In each of our JavaScript files, for, every, for each of our modules, we have all of our input handling mechanisms, excuse me, all of our input handling logic, in the same file. That way, when you look at what it, what it means to be this component, you get a holistic view of what that component does in regards to user input. And as an engineer, that helps my maintainability. And But as an engineer who worries about production, once that goes, to, once that goes out to customers, I don't pay that price anymore because I can comment out entire blocks of code. It just goes away. So it's, it's cool. It means it's, it's being honest and it's being as concise as possible to your, to your devices while being as verbose as possible to your engineers. So, sweet stuff. Props to Joubert for figuring it out. <laughs> when we did this, uh, we actually saved about 185 kilobytes. No lie, our, our, app, our app is over a megabyte, but by killing all the debug code that we had, we're able to save quite a bit of code. And this preprocessor that we use is, is built in-house, most, most neat things are. But when I was actually doing some research to make sure that I could leave you with something to take away, there is an NPM module that does very similar stuff. It actually lets you do, um, do include statements as well. So it's, play with it, try it out. Use it at work. 
I like this slide too. So slaying dragons. Um, dragons to me are, are performance problems. They're memory problems. They're things that left by themselves will, slit, will eat the entire village. When we build new features, we can't actually launch the feature until the dragons are slayed. And sometimes it takes a lot of people. Sometimes it takes one person. Sometimes it's a little innocuous code change. Sometimes it's a re-architecture. But pretty consistently, our <coughs> dragons are displaying grids of video stuff. We have, to us video stuff, well, let, let's, let's back up to customers. Video stuff is what, right? Lists are video stuff. Titles in a list are video stuff. Telenovelas are video stuff. Episodes, seasons, search results, recommendations. They're all video stuff. And depending on the designer, we display different amounts of video stuff. Is it, is it just a box shot? Eh, not really normally. Normally it's a box shot, and there's a bunch of text up here, and a large graphic. Um, so everything really branches off stuff. And we manage a lot of stuff. And recently I had the chance to work with our mobile team. And we were looking at doing some, some innovative work and seeing how far can we push today's tablets. If we pretty much just throw a big pile of work at a tablet and say, go, what's going to happen? So I tried it. And it's not necessarily pretty. The video that, that I'll show you is loading up 700 boxes or 700 images. And there's no, there, the, the implementation is doing nothing nice to the browser. It's just handing the browser 700 image elements and saying, go. So as, we watch, as, we, uh, as I play this, watch the blue bar at the top to see how long it takes to load. And once it's loaded, watch the interaction as I try to scroll it. Watch, watch what WebKit does. It's pretty substandard, right? As we were looking into this, we wanted to try to understand why it was doing this. This is, this is about understanding the big picture. If you look at your, your implementations, a lot of times, what you are is providing a set of unstructured, instru unstructured instructions to the browser. That's just what, what pretty much HTML is. You have, you have order, which is DOM order, but beyond that, the browser does very little to do smart stuff about downloading artwork. Um, so if we dissect what's happening here, we have 700 images entering into a download queue. We have a bunch of markup waiting to, to be rendered. As you navigate, we're downloading the artwork, we're decoding it, and we're, we're painting layers. But the really interesting part of this to me is, why do we see those, those blocks, those sections of, of the UI just completely missing? Anyone want to guess? GPU layers? Yes, yes. WebKit's tile backing store. So the, the reason why WebKit does such a nice job in your, your inertia-based scrolling is because at the point that you're actually scrolling, it's not rendering anymore. It's just taking, and it's taking layers and it's moving them sideways. But the way that it does it is pretty interesting. There's a concept of tiles which intersect the viewport as well as some area on the outside of it. Then there's the rest of the stuff. And the only place where WebKit's working is in that blue section. So when we were loading up those 700 images and we were throwing it, it was trying to render those blue tiles but we were, we, were bound, we were so CPU bound and so GPU bound that we couldn't do it. So this is cool because we can actually go into the source, we can see what a tile backing store is, we can dive into it, and that's awesome. That's about trying to get into the big picture and see what's there. So we define the problem, we understand that we're taxing the device, how do we get out of it? Well, we do it ourselves. So see how fast it loads now? Boom. I do navigate through. If I told you that there were gray boxes there, would that make it any better? <laughs> what, what we're doing here, which you can't see, which I really apologize for, is instead of trying to display image artwork right away, what you're doing is showing placeholders. We're giving the user feedback that content is in this region of the screen, but we can't present it to you right away. We're choosing not to. Now, for us to do this, we do it a lot like WebKit does with the tile backing store. We have, we have this logical concept of reports which are just rectangles. They're rectangles and, it, and elements will intersect with this rectangle or they don't. And the cool part is these rectangles are just logical. They're purely logical, there's nothing really viewport based. We, we choose to make one that is the size of the viewport 
but we can choose to make one that's any height or any or or any um, over height or under height as much as we want. So think about this as a grid <laughs> of stuff to display. We only really want to load images in the tightest, most possible region of the grid, but we want to prep other parts of the grid. So we, we might want to say preload what's down here. We might, we might only want to log what's in the very, very middle of the grid, not, not the stuff on the top and the bottom. So stacking these logical viewports is awesome. And they aren't special. When, in the previous example, if we had had contrast set up and I was really, really good with that, you would have seen that when the image is loaded, we faded them in. They had a nice, a nice, a nice fading. But if, they hadn't, if we didn't need to fade them in, we could have just had a bunch of images. And each image had a placeholder source, a deferral attribute, and then a, a solid background color. And as the user finishes scrolling, we go ahead and figure out what the visible elements are inside this logical viewport. And we pass it over to this method and we say, handle this object. And the, the object that it's handling has a concept of things being shown and things being hidden. Now, that's awesome because in, in the upcoming CSS and HTML attributes, we have the ability to postpone image downloads until elements come into the viewport. But what we lack is the ability to understand when that happens. It's completely up to the browser Im implementation. But more importantly to me, we can't do stuff when the element leaves the viewport. That's, that's, that's out of our hands. But as we're looking at trying to run this, these applications on constrained devices and have large interactive grids, we have to keep a mostly flat memory footprint. So doing things when things are hidden, when, it, when a subject is out of the view, that's, that's really important. We want to be able to reset back to a default state so that you can get nice navigation. Remember how I mentioned preloading? Preloading is huge. Um, and it's so silly that it's 2014 and I'm up here talking to a bunch of professionals about image preloading. I mean, you think that we have this figured out by now. It's just an image. Preload it. Do it in a really efficient way. Um, but yeah, no, 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 we're not there yet. Um, so we're trying to figure out how do we load images the most best way possible. And uh, I say that to you with feigned uh, discouragement, but it's... It is true, because this is kind of BS. Uh, we shouldn't have to worry about how we load images. But the nice part about what we understand about the way things are built, we can think, all right, if we want to preload an image, what is it going to do? We're going to make an image object, maybe an image element. We're going to set the source on that. Something is, is going to fulfill that request. It's going to make the request. It's going to handle the response. It's going to do something where it hands it back to the image elements. All right, cool. So. If we're trying to do this faster, what if we didn't use an image element? What if we just did the, the request, the response, and stopped? And to us, that was like, ah, hallelujah, we scored. Because as, as users are, are scrolling around the page, WebKit stops you from updating the DOM. That's how you get such nice, smooth, smooth uh, animations. But you can still do stuff in the background. So if we're able to project where you're going to wind up when, when you finish the scroll operation, we can preload for that region of the page. <clears throat> so we started looking at. Um, exactly this. Preloading without jank. We want to be able to load and not have you know that we're loading. And now, remember I was mentioned a moment ago about trying to step around what it means to be an image element? Uh, we, we were looking at using blob requests, the part of the XML HTTP request too. This, this is pretty cool. This seems like it should be really, really fast because in my head, it seems to make sense that an image element, maybe behind the scenes, uses a similar implementation path to an XMLHP request object to fulfill the actual request and response activity. Um, so we started with this. This was cool. Um, then I'm like, wait a minute. This doesn't touch the DOM. We don't have to do this in the same document. So we started looking at ways to do it in a worker. Uh, this, this was supposed to be the best. We were supposed to be like, holy shit, we can load all, all sorts of stuff. Because the promise of workers is, at a minimum, they're on a different thread. Ideal case, they're on, they're on a different core. And when we have that sort of separation, we should be able to get very, very clean activity going on in, in our main thread and have this guy that's just over here chugging away. So how do we validate this? Well, we, we have a test. We load up 100 images. We do it 10 times, and we take the median. For the plain image example, the XMHTV request example, and then the workers with, with XMHTV request inside of them example. And it's ironic, but the images beat us every time. And this, this chart makes it look like it's horrific. But if you look at the bottom, it's like 150 milliseconds. This is an iOS 7. And uh, 
all right, so like iOS 7, iPad 2, interesting. So let's try an iPad 3 with iOS 6. So it's not, it's not apples to apples, but it's give me a kind of random survey size and tell me if I'm going the right direction. Well, the direction is it's still slower and it's more complex too. If you have to rationalize what's happening with the application and why we're doing things in this um, complex way, it's a little harder. So in the end, we wanted to pick in the image example. And which I wanted to watch, see what was happening as we profile it. Because one of the best things we have available to us in the web world is a rich set of tools. And it's, it, if, you are, uh, if you're sensitive to flashing lights, don't watch this. So these are loading 1,000 or so, 1,700 um, movie posters off my local host. It has a timer going there in the top left that tells me the FPS that we're hitting. And it's, it's completely contrived. It's entirely contrived, but what it is, it's just saying, what's the brake horsepower of this device? How fast can I push it before it starts to break? Different brake, mind you. So when we looked at the profile for this, it looks like crap. And that's not just because the contrast is bad. It looks like junk because uh, you see, uh, we expect each one of those columns rep represents a frame. And we expect those to be tight, close together, um, but they're not. In fact, you can tell we're doing tons of work. In each frame, we're, we're bumping over the line because our painting operations or our scripting operations are chewing up too many resources. Now, painting is easy to fix. If we want to paint more, more, more rapidly, let's just go ahead and cache each one of those image surfaces as a GPU layer, and then next time it gets set, we'll make a new GPU layer. That way, Every one of the intermediary, intermediary paints, which is doing, is faster. So check this out. This is just us on those images putting translazy. Magic, right? Um, but the, the scripting is still, all, is still all whack. So how do we deal with that? And the answer comes to us from game development. And game development is event loops. It's manage your own event loop. Manage your own timers and split up your work. The, uh, one of the most interesting parts about Rx if, if, if uh, any of you had a chance to look at that yet or were here last time for Joffrey's talk, is how you can break up these, what were earlier, for loops into a bunch of atomic operations. Instead of having a for loop that does this task 10 times, you call a function 10 times. And at, at a skin deep, you're going, holy shit, that, that's 10 function calls. I don't do that. But it's not that bad. It's actually not that bad after all. And when you break down, say, in this image setting example, instead of going, Set the artwork as fast as we can. Set the artwork as fast as we can. We say, browser, give me a frame, and, with, and whenever that frame, I'm going to set the image source. Um, next frame, I'll set the next image source. Next frame, the next image source. So it's it's pretty wacky. It, it's pretty wacky. But you wind up, you wind up being able to squeeze a lot more into the time. So conceptually, it, it would take longer with a scheduler to fulfill the same amount of work that it would if you just put it inside of a type. True. Remember, the goal is to try to reduce jank. It's trying to take these assets, which we want soon, but not necessarily immediately, and have them loaded up in a way that the user never perceives. It just magically works really great. I tear through these slides today. Hope you're all ready. So one of the best things that I found with being in JavaScript, I, I started, started about, I started when he was about two years old, and I uh, sat on my couch every night writing on a laptop until the laptop battery died. And this was like a laptop that was probably this thick, and then there was a screen on top of it, and that thing was bloody hot. Um, but I wrote, I wrote silly things, like table highlighters, and things that say load a different style sheet, or ooh, I can submit a form by clicking on a hyperlink. Mm. And uh, they're, they're trivial examples, totally trivial. But JavaScript's gone really far. I was at JSConf last week, and there's guys piloting submarines in a pool with Node. I'm like, are you kidding me? How did this come about? Some guy woke up and said, hmm, I'm gonna pile a submarine with no. That sounds great. And he didn't stop there. He had floats and had rockets and had helicopters. And uh, it's insane. When, when I first came in to Netflix, uh, a lot of our web stack was based on Java. And I don't like Java. Java's heavy. It sounds scary. I have to have these big IDEs, you know, jar, bar, war. Who knows? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a mess. But, what we've been able to do is we replace a lot of our web stack where we're doing innovation with, with Node and really start building isomorphic web apps that run the same in the server and on the client. And it's, it's sweet. It really is. It's like a, 
you, know, you, you look at this stuff and you realize that JavaScript is on robots, it's on the server, mm -hmm. it's on TV, it's on mobile devices, and it's in web. So as far as uh, picking a good, good profession, I think everyone's room pretty much scored with this one. So good job. Um, that's really all I got for you today. I, I, I hope you're able to pull a little something from it, if not revolutionary, at least informational and pragmatic. And uh, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll be straight up and I, I'll tell you that I found a bottle opener on the speaker's uh, podium over here. So I think there's an underlying signal that we should go have some alcohol. But before we do, I, I want to open up and uh, ask if anyone wants to ask questions about our experience, share their own experience, call bullshit on any of my slides. Um, it's free, free reign. Sir? Did you use any events uh, in the code and field? The, like the, the navigation timing events or? Or like the, the one that I showed up there. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We use we have a couple of different ways of doing it in the field. Um, this was a, a simplified example of how we pull it off. But gathering real user metrics is one of the ways that we make really good informed decisions about a couple of things. Um, one, where we place our actual optimization efforts in the future, as far as um, what we make faster. Um, but two, we actually can track um, release over release to know that we did something bad. Um, some activity which was taking a, this fixed amount of time now takes some sort of that fixed amount of time plus or minus a, a delta. Uh, we do, absolutely do. It's and uh, it's it uh, works out well for us. One the one challenge we have is uh, sometimes we do too much logging, and we have to make sure that that the, that the logs that we're logging are not just informational, but they're also important for making decisions. Um, just logging for logging's sake is is a, a hard trap to fall into, uh, but if you you constrain your logs to being ones that are actionable. That that totally helps. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, before you were saying that there were two different uh, contributors to the jank that you're seeing when you're trying to get the raw like breakneck speed of what you could do with retaining sure. a bunch of images, and you said the first one was uh, solved by like kicking in the GPU and doing translates on the elements, and then the second one was that you're spending too much time scripting. Correct. Um, so you said you got around that by calling a function like x number of times oh. rather than using a for loop. Is that what you're saying? Good question. Uh, I, I didn't really catch that. It's, yeah. Absolutely. The, uh, the question was uh, uh, when I was mentioning that that we were actually breaking up our execution over time. Um, what do we do? How do we do it? And uh, it it was a in, instead of for instance having a for loop that runs ten times, we would have a function that executes one iteration of the for loop ten times spread out over time. So it's a it, it's a standard kind of work disbursement type of uh, activity. And we do it with with um, two things: uh, pure timeouts. Timeouts work fine. Just set a timeout um, for once every say 15 milliseconds, and do some work inside that timeout. You can get pretty fancy about um, at, at each tick in your event loop, each one of those 15 milliseconds, you can work a little bit, just maybe peel off one atomic task and then just run, or you can try to peel off as many as you can. The the latter is much more efficient. Um, when you get onto mobile devices, for instance, uh, Gibbon, our, our native platform, doesn't have the concept of what request animation frame is, but all of our mobile devices and web devices do. So in those, we'll use request animation frame. And uh, that's awesome. It's, it's a double-edged sword in the fact that once you start scrolling, or you start actually touching and moving a little bit, it stops calling the animation frame, so all of our scheduled events stop. Um, so we have to be aware of that. But the ability to do a little bit of work, once we say, say the frame starts at, at zero, and now we're at nine, because you, you really can't go at all 15 milliseconds. You have to stop a little bit ahead of that. Um, we stop working instead of timeout or request another animation frame. And then when that animation frame fires, we do the same thing. So it, 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 takes, it takes four loops out of your code. It just turns everything into a bunch of chain function calls. And um, that's not so evil. Uh, one sec, who, who had the hand raised the first time that I was able? Sorry. I actually had a couple of parts. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that you used the, the from inspector for that. I actually use the plant UML and generate a few sequence diagram information myself. Mm -hmm. I thought that worked really well too. Uh, the other thing was I'm surprised you didn't like mention like promises a lot more in there. Like I found like I mean obviously they can be abused and there are a lot of limitations, but I found like I do a lot of node programming and mm -hmm. I found like they really, really help encapsulate a lot of ideas. Interesting. And structure them more so than just those the callbacks. Nice. We should come to our last talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> On RX, which is what we have promised. We, uh, 
Do any of you guys in the back want to take that? All right. All right. I got it. Um, I, I was going to put some people on the spot, but I'll take it anyway. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> but the video's online, too. So we, we don't use promises. We use uh, reactive extensions, the JavaScript implementation of it, which gives us a better interface. And uh, if, if for nothing else, for me, promises, hey, love me or hate me, um, I think promises fail. Promises are lies because why? You have, you have set timeout, you have clear timeout, you have set interval, you have clear interval, you have add event listener, you have remove event listener. You have give me a promise and then, oh, what? I can't get rid of it. You just can't get rid of it. Um, promises to me are, it's, it's a hole for memory leaks. Because if, when, when you set up a promise, you're saying call this function when you're ready, um, but if, that, if, the, the, if the caller to that function is never ready, the function is never called. So whatever was trapped in the scope of that function at the time you said it is trapped inside memory. And uh, that annoys me. Uh, Rx is good in the fact that you can subscribe to these, to these um, observable sequences. And then when you're done, say you're done because your view was destroyed or the user hit escape or you pressed X or there's an error, you just dispose of it. And then all the memory is reclaimed. So, uh, you have a problem? Yeah, I had to build some custom logic for that problem. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I basically canceled chains and things like that. Yeah. Totally. totally. So, as far as avoiding callback hell and structuring code in a top-down manner, I think promises get that right. And that's that's totally helpful. But it's my my in, in my first interaction with promises, I got about 15 minutes into it and I said, what the hell? And um, I'll still use them, I'll use them when I have to. But it's, I worry that promises are meant for um, people being optimistic about things happening soon versus things happening arbitrarily or later. And uh, I think that's a big assumption making web programming. Sorry. Did you uh, look into implementing a virtual scrolling as a solution? Awesome question. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I got my ass kicked on that one. I really did. Uh, the nice thing with virtual scrolling is things like projecting um, and, and the, in the throw example. When you touch and you throw it, with virtual scrolling, you have a very good idea of where you're going to wind up because you're doing math. Um, with native scrolling, you don't, and your events come late. So when I tried to do the, the virtual scrolling, I got really good, um, I was able to achieve really good awareness of where to do work, but I was never able to match the smoothness at which the actual um, webkit was able to do it with the teleback in store. The, uh, in the back room, the, the folks back there are actually part of our mobile team. So they're the people that I was doing the prototyping with. Um, you should talk, sit down and talk to them sometime, because they, I, uh, I went to bat for, 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 for uh, for virtual scrolling, it's like, I'm, I'm going to score this one. Um, but I, I struck out hard. That's what they did. Let's do, uh, do time for two, three yeah, more. Sure. OK. Uh, how do you manage, uh, manage the um, execution uh, of stuff inside of the um, request animation frame? Do you have like a, like a queue of uh, stuff that you just kind of pick off, or do you have some other kind of structure? Great question, great question. I'm gonna actually push that over here. Lawless. Um, this is Eric Lawless. The, the guys back there are all part of our uh, TDY team. Um, there was a period where we all pretty much write our own schedulers, and Lawless comes from a game development background, and uh, his, his, his one out hands down. So, Eric, how do you manage your, your, your work? Great question. Uh, we do need to keep, uh, so we tried a couple of different approaches. The first one was straight uh, set applications. Uh, there is a decent amount of overhead in our platform crossing the native bridge in the set timeout. So we wanted to eliminate that. Uh, we've got a queue of functions between each execution. Uh, we just measure how much time it took. And we're basically playing black tip, uh, trying to not cross 60, right? Yeah. Um, to help with that, we actually give the functions context. Uh, they have an object that says, this is how long you're expected to take. It's configurable at the top level, so you can say, like, I have 200 milliseconds. It, it was interesting, there were a couple of different approaches you took, but really just a cube is the, the best approach. Thanks. Any more questions? Somebody. Oh, sorry about that. Sir. Ah, I saw you talk about me. Oh, thanks. Very good. Go on. I was going to ask about the topic. Uh, you mentioned switching from a Java. Stack is more of a node stack for the, for the website of things. I think that's really fascinating. What kind of, uh, like, first of all, what was that approach like? Uh, and how are you sharing code between different platforms? 
Great question. Where is Chris Baxter? Panama. Same? Great. I can cover that. So, yeah, we, we've started to go down that path. We have a, a small chunk of the website live on there today. Uh, and we're, um, I guess your question is more on how we started sharing code using applications. Is that what you're looking at? I think that's the, that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're just kind of going down that path right now, and we're kind of approaching our, uh, looking at how we structure our modules and looking at what kind of proper syntax for modules is, whether they're common data modules or yes, it's in syntax. Um, and so I think that's something we're actually actively working on solving right now. I don't think we have clear answer directions on that just yet. The other way in which we're looking at leveraging our, our node stack is um, solving some of the um, kind of common packaging and bundling problems that we have across applications. One thing that makes us fairly unique here is the volume of A-B testing that we do and the wide range of implementations we have in assembling the right templates and CSS and JavaScript bundles to, uh, to load in, in one version of the app that's the right version for you. Uh, so when you're bootstrapping an app and you're starting up, whether it's a web app or a, a full you know, client-side single-page app, uh, we need to do some app resolution at runtime rather than most people do at build time. So we're actually looking at you know, as a runtime solution to doing some of that, um, that packaging and bundling and we've done some experiments on the mobile side as well to see if we can share some common concerns there. Let's do one more. I, I see a lot of restless eyes. All right, so, yeah, okay. So you mentioned isomorphic JavaScript apps. How much uh, do you have, how do you determine what to do on which side? Uh, I'm actually not gonna answer that. Oh, okay. You wanna take that? Yeah, uh, well, the uh, question is, when, when uh, dealing with, JavaScript, with, with an isomorphic app, um, should you introduce yourself to the sure. So I've, I've done some work in, uh, on the set of Airbnb. Um, it was many years ago, but um, it's really a tough question, and I think it really depends on your app and use case and who you're trying to solve for. I see it as a spectrum, so you can share just a few little modules or a few bits of template and logic, or you can share like your entire app. And there's, there's interesting examples along that spectrum. But if you're trying to go for like initial page load performance or SEO, that's that's a use case where you render the whole app on the server side okay. and then pick up the client side app. That's different than if you were just trying to share like application logic. So, um, yes, how do you decide what to share? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think the value is really is having the flexibility to do both and on a per use case basis, being able to really dial that needle back and forth and experiment what works best for your use case. I don't think there's a, a clean answer, but if you, if you structure it in a way that allows you to play at various points along that spectrum, you'll you'll be able to experiment. You'll get it wrong and you'll try it again and then you'll get it right. Good question. Thanks. All right, Kim, I think they're yours. Oh, drinks. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I guess while I got you, um, you can walk out that room. And if you, if you keep walking out that room and you stop and go left or right, you went the wrong way, um, walk out that room until you're outside again. I think there's some people to chef with us. Yeah, I think we actually do go left. <laughs> I mean, go left, and uh, thank you for your time. Don't miss the rest of it.